to take a z-stack, uh, we have to have all of these settings set up so that we're happy with them and uh, we like the image that we get. Uh, then, once once we're happy with that, we can engage Z-Stack mode, and that will open this up here. You can ignore this Ensure Focus Calibration. That doesn't apply to you. Uh, and then what we need to define is what the bottom and the top uh, slice are going to be and what interval we're going to use between the slices. So to define the top and bottom, it's very easy. You can just go to Live and... If you move the focus knob towards you, you go down. You can just set that as your first position. If you go in the other direction, you can go all the way to the other side, set that as your last. And you can make sure that the, those are reasonable positions. So let me set it a little bit more for uh, your different channels. So if you go down here, you can see I, I can't see anything. If I go in the middle, I'm through the middle of the nucleus. The cells are there. This is there. So that's fine. Um, so just like this has a confocal button which sets the optimal pixel size, this has an optimal button uh, which uses an optimal Z-step size. Uh, this one, uh, I, I agree that this is a good pixel size. Um, here, I, I would suggest that if you want the highest possible resolution, use an interval of 0 0.2. Uh, if you're okay with something a little bit um, maybe uh, less um, less high resolution, the Z dimension, you can use whatever it says in optimal. Uh, so I'm going to use 0.2 now. Um, and um, uh, now to um, to uh, acquire the Z stack, we're going to click on Start Experiment. Now notice uh, before I do that, one other thing, which is that you have this option to do all tracks per slice or a full z stack per track so all tracks per slice does all of these things um, for each slice before moving on to the next one if you have a three channel setting uh, i would just do that um, if you have a four channel setting uh, and you have a fixed sample you may want to consider for for speed to do a full z stack per track uh, that's going to be slightly faster so let's go ahead and start the experiment so you can see what it's doing now is it's going to every plane and it's going to take three seconds to take an image at that plane. Um, if you click here on gallery, you can see the different images as they pop up and we can't see much yet. The reason being um, we're a little bit below the sample. So I think I was way too cautious in setting the bottom of the sample here. So you can see, you know, this is a, uh, you can see all the channels here. You can turn channels on and off in the display here. You can select to go to a single channel, which you can have in range indicator mode if you want. There's various combinations of how you can look at things. You can look at different Z positions with this. Um, you can click on follow acquisition for it to always show you the thing it's doing. Um, in split mode, you can see the different channels uh, overlaid this way. In gallery, you see all the little thumbnails of images you acquired, and then in orthogonal, uh, this is uh, these are X Y images, and then these side views are X Z and then Y Z, and you control the position in Z with either this slider or the Z position slider here, and then you control where these cuts are by moving these lines. So if you move here, we're going through the nucleus. Um, and you know you can you can look here whether th certain things overlap. So if you look at that object, you can then see whether things overlap or not. Um, this is not the best sample with which to illustrate this honestly because it's so flat. Um, but with thicker samples, you can really get a, a nice view of things from the side, and that can be uh, very informative. Uh, so that's pretty much all there is to uh, the the basics of taking a Z stack. You can also define Z stacks based on the middle and then just say, okay, we want a certain range. So we always want to take three micron Z stacks. So you could do that here. Um, that also works. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a possible approach. Um, but um, for most people, uh, for most things, what I've discussed is pretty much covers it. Uh, there's really not that much more to Z stacks. So once you have a Z stack, uh, something that I, I recommend you do is considered deconvolving 
uh, the data in that Z stack. So this is a, a procedure that you can do on our workstation with specialized software. You can also do it with your own software, uh, but the, the one we have on our workstation at MSL is quite user-friendly and gives very good results. Um, that will improve the contrast of your images. So if you know you're taking a Z stack, uh, you, can, you can use your knowledge of the fact that you're probably be going to probably going to be doing deconvolution of the Z stack to not push for such a high quality image here because you can clean that up on the back end with the deconvolution. So that's one, um, one advantage of taking Z stacks is that you can then deconvolve them and you can push to have each image in the Z stack be slightly lower quality. Like for example, the red here is a little bit noisy. That'll get cleaned up in the deconvolution. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, your images are taking 16 bits per pixel. That means that uh, your pixel intensities go from zero to two to the 16 minus one. Uh, when you deconvolve them, this is very important, you need to save the deconvolved images as 32-bit floating point images. If you don't, there will be um, a problem with the intensities. They will not be comparable across images. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know.